Last week we ended our sermon about Jesus' favorite subject, which was what? The kingdom of God. We ended the sermon by asking the question, well, what then is the kingdom of God all about? Today I hope to give you at least an overview, at least a sneak preview. We're going to be learning more and more about the kingdom week by week, but today we're going to be learning some very important things. Perhaps an easier question than what is the kingdom is to first ask the question, who is the king? Who's the king? Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Godhead. God's the king of the kingdom. Uh, But it's easier actually before we go on. Let me show you a couple of Bible verses here. I'm going to put it on the screen so it's a little bit easier for you. Just a couple of sampling uh, verses from the scriptures. Psalm 103, verse 19. It says, the Lord has established his what? His throne, where? In heaven. And his kingdom rules how much? Over all. Um, We don't know exactly where heaven's at, but God's throne rules over all. That means the entire of the entirety of the universe. God is king over the entire universe. What about Daniel 4 verse 3? Even the the pagan king who was being converted by God, he said, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is what kind of kingdom? Everlasting kingdom. There's no beginning and there's no end to it. And his dominion is from generation to generation. God is the all-powerful sovereign of the universe. There's never been a time when he hasn't been king over all. Or what about Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8? But to the Son, he says, your throne, O what? O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. We could talk a lot more about this, but the simple answer to who's the king? God's the king. But then our next question, in order to understand the kingdom, that I want to ask this morning is, when is the kingdom? We've already seen, yeah, yeah, God's kingdom is forever and ever, but Scripture gives us some different data points that I want to look at this morning. Because in one sense, the kingdom is already here. In one sense, it's already here. Look at what even John the Baptist said, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is distantly in the future. What's it say? At hand. Jesus said the same thing. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. Or what about Mark 1? Let's see, I got ahead of myself. Didn't get this slide in here. I'm going to read you this one. Mark 1.15, take my word for it or look it up. And saying that time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus said the time is fulfilled. What time was he referring to when he proclaimed this? He was talking about the time prophecy in the book of Daniel. The prophecy predicting 490 years prophecy that that showed God's work with his people in the bringing about of the Messiah. And at the end of this time prophecy, Jesus is saying, the time is fulfilled. Repent because the kingdom is at hand. It's not some distant thing. The kingdom is at hand. And then we get to the next verse, Luke chapter 9, verse 27. Jesus said, but truly, I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see what? The kingdom of God. I haven't seen people who are living for 2,000 years. So those people, in some way, saw in their day the kingdom of God. Or what did Jesus say in Luke chapter 10, verse 9? He said, heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has done what? Has come near to you. And one more verse here. 
But if it is by the finger of God that I, or that I cast out demons by the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. They were, uh, not everybody was excited and enthusiastic about the miracles Jesus was working. Uh, and they were accusing him of working with demons or this or that. But he's saying, if it's by the finger of God, which it was, the kingdom of God has then come upon you. So because of what Jesus taught, we can say, yeah, the kingdom is already here. It's already here. However, it gets a little complicated because then there are other things that Jesus said that make us think that the kingdom is not yet here. Look at what the Bible says in Luke chapter 23. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, who said these words? The thief on the cross. Now, he wasn't very, perhaps, educated in all the things, but if Jesus had obviously, clearly set up a kingdom right then and there, then he wouldn't have said, remember when, me when you come into your kingdom. It was a future thing for the thief on the cross, but it's very similar to what Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, Luke 11, verse 2. He said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom, what? Come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You don't pray for something to come if it's already arrived. I don't call Amazon support services saying, hey, could you please send my package? when my package has already arrived. And you shouldn't do that either, right? <laughs> Sometimes you call them, and you say, my package hasn't arrived, and they say, okay, we'll send you another, and, and then you get two of them. And you call them, and you, they say, no, just keep both of them. <laughs> but you see the point, right? If something's here, you don't need to pray for it to be here. Jesus, in some way, was talking about a future kingdom. Or what about this one? We'll talk about this again, perhaps, when we have communion in, in two Sabbaths. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day I drink it with you new, talking about grape juice, in my Father's kingdom. Jesus was going to hold off on his favorite beverage, grape juice, until he could have it again with his disciples in person in the kingdom. And, and when was he referring to? What, what event or what place was he talking about? He's talking about heaven. And they can all be together again in heaven. The kingdom's not yet here, Jesus is saying. Or what about in Luke 19, verse 11? He told this parable. As he, they heard these things, he proceeded to tell them a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God would appear when? Immediately. They thought it was going to be here immediately, and so he told them a story that involved the element of waiting. It's not here yet, guys. You're going to have to wait. What about this? Matthew 8, verse 11. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with who? Abraham and who else? Isaac and Jacob. Where? Where? in the kingdom of heaven. By the way, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are the same thing. Um, I can show you that in other places. Same thing. So Jesus said, you're going to get to sit down with these guys, these great people of faith, and you'll do it in the kingdom of heaven, which is still yet future. So how do we understand this? On the one hand, Jesus said, hey, the kingdom's right here. And on the other hand, he says, it's in the future. It's, it's already, but not yet. And the answer, I think, is that the kingdom can be understood in different ways. There are different ways to understand the kingdom. Broadly speaking, as we already mentioned this morning, God is the king of the universe. And so in the most broad, general sense, the kingdom is all of God's domain, which has never had 
um, a starting point as far as the universe goes. It's just, if the, as long as the universe has been, God has been the king over the universe. And more narrowly, there's a spiritual component to God's kingdom, isn't there? Uh, in a certain sense, anyone who submits to God as king accepts him as king in their hearts. They are immediately a part of the kingdom of God. And on the opposite side, those who reject God in their hearts are not a part of this spiritual kingdom. And Jesus pointed to this nature of the spiritual kingdom in, in several different ways. Look at this here. John 18, verse 36. Jesus answered and said, My kingdom is not of this what? It's an out-of-this-world kingdom. If it were of this world, my servants would fight. So I should not have been delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not from here. Notice he said, now. At least for this present moment, my kingdom is not located physically here in this world. It's out of this world. What else? Jesus in Matthew 4.17, we already saw this verse. He taught that repentance is involved in becoming a part of the kingdom. Hey, the kingdom's at hand. Prepare yourselves by repenting. I don't know of any earthly kingdom that asks people to repent in this way. This is a spiritual kingdom. Or what about Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus? He said in John 3, verse 5, Most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He didn't say, unless you can pass this test to be a part of our nation and say the Pledge of Allegiance and, and sign an oath to loyalty. It wasn't those sorts of things. It was a spiritual rebirth that needed to take place in order to be a part of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual one. And notice this, this last one here. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with what? Observation. You can't have your spy satellites looking down from uh, the atmosphere or outside of the atmosphere, uh, and looking down to see the movement of troops and, and, and so forth. You can't observe with your eyes the kingdom. Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is where? Within you. Uh, now that phrase could either mean in your midst or in your heart, or, or you're able to grasp it. In fact, I think Jesus was the embodiment of this spiritual kingdom. So the kingdom is, is spiritual, uh, and this helps us understand how, in his day, he could say, yeah, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Theologians like to talk about the spiritual kingdom as the kingdom of grace. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, we're told that we can come boldly to the throne of what? Grace. If there's a throne of grace, it makes sense to call it a kingdom of grace. And we can access that kingdom right now because of what Jesus has done for us, instituted at the fall of man and established at the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. So in that sense, the kingdom is already here. But as we saw already, it's, that's not the only sense in, what Je in which Jesus talked about the kingdom. There's also a physical kingdom that Jesus spoke about, isn't there? One that we can see with our eyes, we can touch with our hands, we can participate in, in doing literal, physical things. And the Bible tells us that that kingdom will arrive when Jesus returns to the world. Notice how it was put in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings, in the, in the last days of Earth's history, as you have studied or could study this prophecy, the God of heaven will set up a what? A kingdom. This corresponds to that stone that smashed the image, this timeline of history. 
the stone was the kingdom of God. He'll set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall uh, break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for how long? Forever. When Jesus returns, then we have the kingdom of glory, as they call it, that will be established. Kingdom of grace and a kingdom of glory. Or notice what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Uh, The kingdom of glory is associated with Jesus appearing on this earth once more. And all who have been a part of the kingdom of grace get to be a part of the kingdom of glory. No matter what age they've lived in, no matter whether they are alive at the time of Jesus' return or dead, if they've been a part and are a part of that spiritual kingdom, they will be a part of that physical kingdom too. I love how um, Ellen White summarized this. Um, She recognized these different components of the kingdom as well. When Christ was on this earth, he chose 12 disciples to, to be constantly with him. He did not call attention uh, to the purposes and laws of the kingdoms of the world, but to a higher, holier theme. The purposes and laws of what? The kingdom of God. He was trying to get their attention on the kingdom of God. He didn't speak to them of politics. It's easy to get too distracted by politics. I say vote, be good citizens, but don't be too distracted by this. We're citizens of a different kingdom, amen? Jesus was teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God in the face of the chaos of the political world in his day. He didn't speak to them of politics, but of subjects that concern them as stewards of his what? His grace. He gave them a general idea of the character of his kingdom and of its working as a kingdom of what? Grace in this world and a kingdom of glory in the future world. He told them that it was not an earthly, temporal kingdom, but a kingdom that would endure forever. So the kingdom is already, but it's also not yet. But everyone who wants to participate in that future kingdom of glory and power and perfect peace in a world made new must first participate in the kingdom of grace, by receiving the king of grace into their hearts and lives. I've shared this story with you before, but it's worth repeating. A number of years ago, the famous actor Telly Savalas, Greek-born American actor, uh, was traveling back to his home nation of Greece And as you can imagine, being a famous person is not an easy thing. You get approached by people all the time wanting autographs. And uh, this was before the days of selfies, but (laughs) it's even worse these days for people who are famous. Even famous pastors and evangelists, it's tough on them, I imagine. So Telly is on this airplane, he's going home, and he doesn't want to be bugged. So he gets a newspaper and he puts it up in his face so nobody can see him on the airplane. Somebody comes and sits down next to him. He doesn't know who. Eventually, the man next to him recognizes him. Ah, Mr. Savalas, my family and I are such big fans of you and your work. We love your show on TV. Would you please sign something for my family? They would, my wife and kids would love to have your autograph. No. He pulls the paper. I'm not going to be bothered. Flight goes on. They're approaching. Greece, approaching the landing. Mr. Savalas, I I know it's a a bother, but would you please mind? Didn't even say a word. As they're pulling in to, uh, they've landed now, as they're pulling into the airport, the pilot comes on and says, as you probably have noticed, we have a very special guest on our flight today. We would ask you to stay clear of the aisles until he can get off the plane and be on his way. And Mr. Savalas is thinking, oh, I didn't want this. I just want to be a normal person and visit my family. 
But before he can gather his stuff and get up, he notices that the gentleman who was next to him was gone. Wait, well, that wasn't for me? Well, who, who was I sitting next to? And it doesn't take him long before he learns that it was the king of Greece that he had been next to. He was sitting in the presence of the king, and he didn't even know it. Brothers and sisters, those watching at home, we are in the presence of a king. The only king. The king of the kingdom of God. And we can be a part of this kingdom of grace right here and right now. And when Jesus returns, we can also be a part of his kingdom of glory. I want to connect with my king today. How about you? I want him in my life, and I want to be his servant and go on his missions. Is that your desire this morning? Amen. Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, you're not only our father, but you're our king. And we are so grateful that it's because of your grace because of what heaven has done for us, uh, that we can be free of our sins, forgiven and empowered to make better choices. Thank you for the assurance of your salvation. Thank you for coming into our hearts and lives. Please sit on the throne in my heart and the heart of our friends here this morning. Be our king in the kingdom of grace, and someday soon, Lord, please come back. More than seeing the king of glory, we, w- we just want to see you the king. And we look forward to that day. Use us to help others know how good you are. And this is our prayer. Let all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And